All right. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Rolina Ghosh, and I'm uh, one of the senior members of the parent education team. And welcome to the Power of Play. Um, this program is being hosted by the D103 Parent Ed Team. Our team's goal is to provide you with quality parent programming content for the families of D103. Um, keep in mind that your PTO dollars are what support this programming. So if you're not a PTO member yet, please join. Um, our parent ed team this year consists of myself, Nana Adjaman, who's on the screen, um, Alyssa Banks, who's with us, Mina Geary, and Yu Zhao. Um, we're also extremely fortunate to be partnering for the last two years with the Vernon Area Library and Jen Ernstein, who is the Youth and Teen Program Coordinator. She's also our Zoom host for this afternoon's event. So a couple of housekeeping things. Um, please note that our chat will be disabled, but the Q&A will be open for questions. Um, please use the Q&A feature to submit questions for our speaker throughout the talk. But myself and the rest of the parent ed team will be monitoring these questions, which will be answered at the end of the presentation. Um, during the presentation, also, um, you can reference Dr. Isabel's handout, which you should have received yesterday from Eventbrite. Um, but if you didn't receive it, I will drop that link into the chat, okay, or actually the Q&A, so you can reference it too. Um, also, today's um, presentation is being recorded, thanks to Dr. Isabel and the library, and we will put that on the Vernon Area YouTube website for the next four weeks. Um, and today's topic is one that was championed by um, Miss Ann Hoffmeyer, who is the principal of Laura B. Sprague School. Um, Ms. Hoffmeyer has been in education for three decades. She has spanned the role as teacher, assistant principal, curriculum director, special ed, ed administrator, and principal. It's not a surprise that her favorite role uh, has been principal of Sprague, um, where she has served our community of pre-kindergarten to second grade students for the last seven years. She is a lover of reading, travel, and animals, and she has quite a brood of two lovable Newfoundland dogs, two parrotlets, and an axolotl, which I had asked my daughter how to pronounce. Um, now, <laughs> I will hand it over to Ms. Hoffmeyer, who will introduce Dr. Isabel, who is our guest speaker for today. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, we really appreciate you and your time spent. Um, Dr. Isabel is, I'm sorry, my computer just went down and I can't find her intro. I'm, um, But the reason why we chose to have her here is because she is an expert in play and um, something that is really important to the spread community, as well as to um, our teachers and our students is the power of play and being able to infuse play within the classroom and to have opportunities where I can have, um, we can see that that is something that is engaging to students. So thank you so much for being here, Dr. Isbell. We really appreciate you. And I'm going to ask you to speak a little bit to yourself and your expertise because my I lost the power to see anything other than you or your lovely face. But thank you so much for being here. I appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, I, I always feel a little embarrassed to talk about myself. <laughs> but um, I have a long history in early childhood um, and um, started out as a teacher in the classroom and then worked with gifted and talented and then moved into having working toward a graduate degree while I was teaching and becoming a professor of early childhood uh, at East Tennessee State University. Uh, here I also was the director of the lab school, which was an early childhood program, Infants Through Five. And then during that time, I became the director of the Center of Excellence in Early Childhood for the state of Tennessee. Um, I've also written 13 books. And what I wanted to share with you today that I think is really important is I am a parent. Um, and I have raised two children uh, who are now adults and who I have been through all the trials and fire, fire burning that you as parents have to go through. Uh, and let me tell you, the end is, is great and it is a great joy, although we do have our moments of difficulty. I thought it might be interesting for me to just share one uh, parent moment, just to say that we're all human. Um, when I had when I was at home for three years with a two-year-old and a brand new baby, um, I they were 19 months apart. 
I was tired as most of you probably are. Uh, and so uh, I was sitting in my chair and, and by necessity, there had to be a nap. It wasn't a really a nap, but it was a quiet time. Um, and my son who was very active and has always been, uh, he would go in his room and he would be uh, active and quiet. And so one day I was in my chair enjoying the peace of five minutes, as some of you know, that wonderful book uh, about five minutes of peace. Um, and I was enjoying it, but as, a, as any mother wouldn't do, I knew that if he was quiet, there was probably a problem. Uh, but I didn't want to go too quickly because I was really enjoying the quiet time. Uh, and so when I did go to his room I opened the door for his room and he was at the time three and I and he had taken a permanent magic marker how do we they find those it's like that they can smell out the permanent ones uh, and he had taken that black permanent marker and had drawn all over his carpet uh, and I looked at it, and as any parent, I was exasperated. And I said, oh, Marty, how could you have done that? And then the great way that children, young children, always answer us with their very special way of saying it. He said, I couldn't find any paper. <laughs> And he is now today an orthopedic surgeon. So he did make it through my moments. So a uh, very great crisis. But he always reminds me that I said he had to clean it up. And so we both together got on the floor with rags and were scrubbing. And he would look at me. He said, I tired, mommy. I said, scrub, scrub. <laughs> And as a child, he always says to me, Mom, it was forever that I was scrubbing. Uh, and of course, it was just a few minutes, but he did survive and he did become a very nice person and very capable. But but he had his moments as all children and parents do. So I just wanted you to know before we talk about anything else, I've been there, done it, and can tell you not only the trials of it, but the joys of it after it's over. So let's get started with our presentation. And I'm happy to say I have a wonderful assistant here helping me today, Christian. Uh, so if we have any problems, I'm going to let him help us sort it out. But let's just start by talking about what is the value of play? Why is it important? Why should we have a parent workshop that deals with play? Well, first of all, I think we need to just explain what play is because some people don't really understand. They think it's the opposite of work. Well, with young children, it isn't. It's what they do as they learn. And play is active as young children are. It's spontaneous. It brings them joy. It is self-initiated. It's intensively involving. And it's an avenue for learning in so many different ways. And I'm going to share with you some of the ways that play helps their learning. These are just some home pictures from children playing in their home. The little boy on the left is rolling a ball into a, a laundry basket. And notice that the ball is big because when you have a young child, the bigger the ball. As they get older, they can have smaller balls. But it allows young children, because their coordination is developing, they need big balls to use. The little girl on the right is a preschooler and she's already into using blocks. And and lining them up and putting them, sorting them. And the little girl on the left is doing imaginary play, which is so important for development. And then in the middle siblings who are actually for one time enjoying each other's company. And then to remind you that babies play too. One of the baby here is hitting at a mobile. And what he finds out is that if you touch the mobile, it moves. And he is so excited about that possibility. So he repeats that motion over and over and over. And during the time he's doing it, you can see that he really enjoys it because he laughs. 
Uh, one of the things that we know with play is it is an enjoyable activity. Now let's think about how many different areas of development play works with. It's not a sit in your seat, be quiet, follow my directions. It's an active learning process. And so the children are learning intellectually, and we'll talk about how some of those ways are, but they develop their intellect. How do things work? How do you put them together? What happens when I do this? What is the cause and effect? They're always learning new vocabulary during these early years. And it's such an exciting thing because they're like a little child carrying a great big bag and every new word they hear, they put it in there. And if it's connected to their place, to their play, it has even more meaning for them. And of course, their physical development is occurring as they're doing balls and big things and then small motors as they do in small in early childhood, we don't like to think about things individually. We think about the whole child's development. And of course, one that we know is so critical and has always been a basis of the early years is social skills. How do you develop social skills? How do you learn to get along with other people? How do you learn to work with people? There's a lot of other benefits of play as well, and one of them is it helps reduce stress. Now, some of you may say, well, I don't have any stress. Uh, the child, I am the one with all the stress. The child really doesn't have any, but it's amazing how stress uh, plays with children, and one of the ways that we deal with trauma or problems is through play therapy, because in play, the child is able to work out their problems. They're able to try it one way and then another, and then they develop empathy. How do I feel about you? How do I feel about the world? Can I be empathetic? Now, it's important for us as parents to re realize this doesn't happen overnight, it takes a long time to develop empathy, but this is the beginning step of it. And it also helps them to be resilient because in play, if it doesn't work the first time, you can change it and do it another way. Mistakes are okay. Now, just because I think you need to kind of understand that there's not just one kind of play and children just do it at a certain age of development. Children really move back and forth from all of these different kinds of play. And there's not one place that you can say, well, this only happens in preschool or this only happens. No, it goes in and out as they're playing. So solitary play is where a child plays on their own. They don't need anybody else. They just do it themselves. Parallel play is one that we sometimes misunderstand. We say, well, oh, they're playing together, but they're really not playing together. They're playing the same thing, but they're side by side. They're not interacting. They're not exchanging anything. One of my favorite kinds of play is symbolic play, where they begin to use something to stand for something else. I give you a cup it's a tiny little cup and say, would you like to have some coffee? And then a little bit later, I might just give you a hand and there's nothing in it. That is symbolic representation, which is all done in their heads. And symbolic representation is the foundation for language, for reading, for writing, for mathematics. It is such an important ability. And we see that developing all during those early years, all the way from infancy up to third grade. And it, and it still continues to do, but our focus is zero to eight. Sociodramatic play is a very high level of play. And that's where the child takes on the role of somebody else. And it's often mother and father in the beginning or grandparents or someone that's important in their lives. I walked by the home living center one day and a little girl had a sticky note that she put on the refrigerator. And I said to her, what does your sticky note say? And she says, I'm going to be late, start dinner. And I had to laugh because I thought of how many times that had happened to me and probably happened to you too, where we have, we're late, we have to think about dinner, we have to think about how we get that done. 
Functional play is something like riding a tricycle, being able to roll a ball. Those are functional kinds of play. And the, the highest, it's not really the highest level, but it's the last one in developing is games with rules. And that usually doesn't come until children are about seven or eight, nine. It's not really in the early years. I had a parent one time at Christmas time who said to me, I'm really concerned my little boy cheats and she's concerned he's going to be a thief, he's going to be bad, all of these things that parents think about. And I said, what makes you think that? And she said, we had a game for Christmas and, and he cheated. When he rolled the dice, he always moved it however much he wanted. He didn't go by the rules. And I said, I think it's okay. He is in the game to win. That's what egocentric young children want to do. They want to win. And when he gets a little older and he has more maturity, he will be able to work with rules that somebody else set up. But right now, he has his own way of playing, and he's not going to grow up to be a thief or a crook. He is just playing at his level of development. So these are some of the different types, but they go in and out of it. There's not one time that they're always there. And then they have different areas when they're different ages and different stages. For instance, an infant plays with himself. He loves his fingers. He loves his toes. He likes that little soft squishy. So he plays with things in his immediate environment and his body is one of those. And he also plays with his voice where he will make sounds and, and he will repeat. He almost sounds like we do. <laughs> So he plays with his voice and when he's enjoying it, he'll go <laughs> and he'll laugh in it. So, you know, he's enjoying the play in toddlers. We begin to see them developing a reaction and interaction with toys or materials. I, I think of them more as materials rather than toys. And the toddler is on the move. If you're a parent of a toddler, you know what I mean. They are walking, they are climbing, they're doing things all day long. And so when we play or they play, it has to be when they're moving, when they're doing something. Three to five, we begin to see them being more concerned about playing not only by themselves, but with other people. And so there's more of an interest in the social play. And we'll begin to see them developing skills in their play. And by six to eight, we see them becoming more social, very concerned about fairness, uh, taking turns and sharing. But remember, this takes years. I have some adult friends who are still having trouble sharing. So don't expect it to happen overnight. It will take a while and it will be a constant moving forward. I was so pleased when the American Academy of Pediatrics came out with a statement about play. And as a parent and as an educator, it was great to know that pediatricians agreed with us and were on the same page with how important play is for a young child. And I'm going to read it to you because I want to use their wonderful words. Play is essential for helping children reach important social and emotional and cognitive milestones. Isn't that a wonderful statement? Yes, true. But they went on to say, it is also helpful in developing the ability to cope with problems and issues that they have to deal with, and it will strengthen their ability to adjust. And as you and I know, life is filled with adjustments. I put this in your handout, so if you wanted to use it or think about it again, I'd like for you to review that idea. Lots of wonderful minds have talked about the value of play. Albert Einstein said, my best ideas come when I'm playing. 
He not only valued it for young children, but he valued it as a scientist, as a way of coming up with new and innovative ideas. And then our neighbor, he said, play is often talked about as if it were a relief from serious learning. But for children, play is serious learning. Did you get that? For children, play is serious learning. Now you say, well, okay, that sounds pretty good. I guess that's an important thing to include in my child's life. But how do I get started? How do I make that work? And I added just a few points that I think will help you get started and to think about. Before you jump into their play, I think the first thing you want to do is just observe their play. What do they enjoy doing? What are they playing? How are they playing? And when do they invite you into their play? Show an interest in their play, because if if mommy and daddy and granny and other people are interested in play, it must be important. And so you are reinforcing that. Give them feedback as they're doing play. Don't just say good job, but make your comments relate to what the child is doing. There's your gro vocabulary growth. You're pouring the water. Look what you did. You're making comments that connect the words to the actions. This is the best learning for language that we can do. You can also extend play, offering new materials or often offering new possibilities. If your child is playing with cars, you might ask a question, which of your cars is the fastest? How can we make it faster? Would you like to add another car to your play? It's important for us to realize that this is children's play. We want to follow their direction. Play and learn alongside your child. Your child is watching you. One of the things about young children, because they are in the process of developing language and it's not complete yet, is that they learn by watching you, often more than your words. So when you make a new discovery, when you're playing with them, comment about, oh, I didn't know that. Gosh, look what I just learned. We want our children to recognize that learning is a lifetime process and that it is exciting. Several people ask about materials and I'm gonna kind of hedge a little bit on this one because I think it's important that you remember that young ch children are in the process of learning about their world. So everything is a potential toy. Household materials like pots and pans, toilet paper in the bathroom, open-ended materials. That's the best. Those are ones that can do a lot of different things like stones or clay or materials that can be used how the child wants to use it. And sometimes we want to include some unique materials, something they haven't ever seen before. And one of the things about how the brain works for young children, they seek out unique and, un and unusual things. Twigs, acorns, corks, things you might not even think about as being play materials. Now, one of the things that we can do as parents is to set up little areas in the corner of a room or in a closet or somewhere where a child can play quietly on their own. And some of the areas that I've seen work so well in homes are dress up areas, 
And I'll talk about each one of these as we look at this. Find a place in your home where you can put old hats, dress up clothes, all kinds of intriguing things to try on. And this is one guaranteed place children will enjoy playing. It can be on their own, it can be with you, or it can be with a friend. But the dress up area has so many possibilities and it's so easy to set up in a corner and you can stand back and watch your child create. One of my favorites is the building and construction area. Boy, I've picked up a lot of Legos over my life. And what I want you to think about is, is how can you have blocks and building materials in your, in your home? What can I set up? Where can I put it? And it's also important as we think about these play areas to re realize that we want to develop responsible behavior in our children as they're playing. So one of the things that we need to do is include them in the cleanup. And blocks is one of those building materials or, or one of those that takes a lot of time to clean up. But what you have to understand is that it's something we often don't want to do, but children enjoy being the part of the cleaning process. In the art area, nothing could be more fun and interesting than using a sponge that has soap bubbles. So we're cleaning up the area, but we're also enjoying the process of cleaning up, which is a part of play. And these, this creative area can include all kinds of junk items that you have around the house. You don't have to buy anything. You may need some paper, some color paper that uh, you might have to buy or some glue or something like that. But basically it is collecting and putting materials together. Another real popular one now is a home gym where you have some things set up that a child can do. Rolling a ball, playing, doing yoga with you, doing all kinds of physical activities because so many children today are not involved in physical activity. And then of course, science. Uh, in science, it can be cooking, it can be mixing things, it can be watching the caterpillar, it can be picking up things in the, on a walk together, and then you put it in the uh, a little area. It's important to have a, a special place for it so that they feel like their play is valuable and that they can do it on their own. They can be a part of that on their own. Now, for the last five years, I've been studying the 21st century skills because the children in our early childhood programs now are going to be adults in 2050, 2060, 2070, and you can only imagine what the world is going to be like. It will be a very different place. So one of the skills that every committee of the 21st century say that is essential for young children today in our classroom is and in our home is creativity. We need children who are thinkers and problem solvers. And play is one of the places that this can really occur and can be encouraged. A box is not a box. A box is a train. A box is a store. A box is a bed. It can be whatever the child wants it to be. It allows them to be creative and flexible thinkers. That's what we need for the future. In the last few years, we've seen some new research that has supported the, well, for years we've had research that supported the development of, of play in young children, how, how important it is. But recently we've begun to look at what are the benefits for adults? Can play be beneficial to our stressed out, strung over parents? And the research seems to say that play is good for adults. It allows them to be creative. It helps them to decrease their own anxiety. And it builds cohesiveness within the family as they play together. There's a new, uh, just last couple of weeks ago, a new article by Newsweek that the question said, 
do you play enough? And it was focused for adults. And their conclusion was, no, we don't play enough. We need to have more opportunities to play. So play is not only good for your child, but it's also good for you. Now let's summarize for a minute what play is and why it is something we should value and to help children have. First of all, play stimulates cognitive development. What kind of cognitive development? How things work? How do you put them together? How, what does this cause when I do this? How can I think about how to solve a problem when I don't have enough materials? What do I have to do? So play stimulates cognitive development. Play also stimulates literacy and new vocabulary. We are working with children who are in the midst of what is called the window of opportunity for language. Never again will we learn language at the speed we do during the period from two to six years of age. A child goes from just a few words to the time that many of them enter kindergarten, they'll have thousands of words. And of course it varies from child to child. But play allows them to learn new vocabulary, not by sitting and drilling you on that, but actually using the new vocabulary. This is really interesting research. The best language is when it accompanies activity. And in play, the child is an active learner, participating in their learning, guiding the experience, leading you in their play. And it provides opportunity for their physical development, rolling a ball, moving their bodies, playing both indoors and outdoors. And we've, we're seeing a new emphasis on outdoor play because we know children play differently when they play outdoors. We know that in Finland, in every hour a child is in a program, 15 minutes of that time is spent in physical activity. What we need to think about more is adding more physical activity in our early childhood classrooms and in our homes, because this is how children refine and develop their skills. Now, children practice and use social skills during play. Now, I want to just really expand on this because most of us think that children know how to take turns. They know who's gonna lead. They know how to let somebody else be a part of the process. But really all of that is, is a learning thing. And what we found from the research during COVID was that children were often being in, in homes with not very many people to interact with. And so their social skills when they came back into a program were delayed. Not because they weren't social human beings, but because they hadn't had opportunity for social interactions. So think about how you can add more social opportunities in your home. Can it be to ask another child over for a playtime? Can it be to ask grandma over to play because grandma and child will love playing together and they will learn how to work together in that play experience. They will learn to take turns. They will learn to let the other person lead and sometimes be the leader themselves. And so this adjustment and opportunity helps them. Play also reduces stress. 
if your child has, which more and more children are having in earlier and earlier ages. When I first began teaching, children had school anxiety at fourth grade. Now we see children being more anxious earlier and earlier. And so we want to help them understand how to reduce that stress, how they can do things that will help them be more competent, more relaxed, more calm. And play is one of the places this can happen. I watched a little girl rocking her baby and she was pretending to be the mother. And another little girl was making the sounds for the baby doll. And the baby doll was screaming in a high-pitched, horrible voice. And the mother was trying to calm her. Trying to calm her, and nothing would calm her. She got her up. She walked her around. She did all the things that she had seen. Maybe her own mother or a caregiver do. But what she did, the mother that was the little girl that was doing this sociodramatic play related to the mothers, she put her hands to her head and she said, I don't think I can stand another minute of this. I have to believe in that one short moment, she is developing empathy for her mama and what her mama did when she was crying or her brother's sister was crying. We talked a lot today about resilience, where children today need to be resilient people. That means that they can deal with problems, they can work through them, and they can come out okay on the other side. And play allows you to develop that resilience. Piaget, one of the famous child psychologists, said that when he took his child to get a shot, she screamed and yelled and cried in what you and I might say a temper tantrum, but of course, you know, he would not call it that. And he said she came home, she got her doll, she got a stick, and she began to give her doll an inoculation and the baby didn't cry. The baby was strong and brave and she was working through how she could respond to that difficult situation. And he says that the next time she went, she threw no temper tantrum. She took the shot and she made a comment about how brave she was. So what we know is that in play, you can pretend, you can work out problems, you can decide how to respond, and it helps you be more resilient as you move into the world. And then one that I think is really critical for our young children today is that play provides you opportunity to develop creative problem solving. How can you build a tower very tall, as tall as you, but still not fall over? How can you stretch it out so it's wide and wide, but still represents a garage parking lot? So play provides you an opportunity to be a problem solver, and a creative thinker. I want you to think about play in a new way. Don't think about it as something I have to get my child to do. I have to do it with them. What I want you to think about is how wonderful it is, what a great learning tool it is, and relax, enjoy it, and build a wonderful relationship with your child. Thank you. I need to move that last slide up. Okay. Oh. 
All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Isabel. That was so informative uh, and really touched on so many different areas that I think that parents are going to be able to use in their homes very practically and just helps us understand a little bit better about how important this you know, part of their life is. Um, it is. Yeah. Yes, it really is. And so, you know, I will give our audience um, some time to, you know, construct their own questions, but our parent ed team did come up with some questions on our own as well um, that we wanted to start. And I know you've touched on some of these things, but perhaps you can expand on some of these ideas. So and I do want to mention that on my website, under free resource materials. There are in-depth explanations of the different uh, learning and play areas that I talked about. That's and amazing. so as a parent, you can go on there, get a copy of one of those, and it kind of gives you an idea about what materials to collect, what you can do to set it up and make it a really special place. It gives you all those kinds of, and books that you can use along with it, because I always think the book part is very important. Yes, exactly. Um, so those are free, and I just did them to help you as you're setting up and thinking more about play in your in your class in your home with your young children. Yeah, that's great. That's really good. And I, you know, I just think back to the classrooms when my my kids are older now, thirteen and seventeen. But when I was at Sprague, I feel like I can imagine the classroom with these different centers in them. You know, and so it's it's nice to see that you know Sprague's. Uh, mirroring a lot of these things already. So, and it doesn't take a lot of space or a lot of materials. Uh, it's just really grouping it, grouping them together so that they can go there and do it independently or if they want you to join them, inviting you to come in with them. Well, that leads to us to our first question, you know? So my first question for you is, I think parents have this question a lot, is do I have to be part of my child's play at home? And no. should I, yeah. I yeah, go ahead. What's your thoughts on that? Well, I don't think you have to. And if, and I think that, first of all, if it's not a joyful experience for you, you probably don't want to go into the play. <laughs> <laughs> because the whole point of play is that it's joyful. Right. It brings the child joy. And uh, if you don't really enjoy, find someone who does. Maybe grandparents or a teenager or a brother or sister might enjoy playing with them. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't always have to be with somebody else. And you don't have to be the one. Because I know, and I was a working mother my entire career, uh, I know that we, we have a limited amount of time. Mm -hmm. And we're thinking, oh my gosh, there's one more thing I have to do. <laughs> uh, no. Uh, it, it's if the child invites you to come in, but it's always important to let the child lead the play. Mm -hmm. uh, we want the child to feel powerful and play is one of the places they can. They gain confidence. They begin to realize that they can solve problems. They're capable of making decisions, you know, all of those wonderful things. Uh, so you don't have to be there. Okay. It does help if you will provide a place and some materials, and I also think time. Sometimes we don't give them sufficient time to get, play takes time. They have to get into the play. They have to decide roles. They have to, I mean, it takes some time to do it. Mm -hmm. And so we don't want to say, oh, we have you know, 10 minutes to play right. before dinner. No, no, <laughs> it's probably not going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you're going to be frustrated and they will be as well. So well, you want to think about it as being more time. Also, if they're enjoying the play, it is a marvelous thing to watch because mm -hmm. you learn so much about your child. You know, what are they interested in? What are the words they're saying? What are the questions that they're posing? It just makes your connection to them so much stronger. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think you answered the question that you should let your child lead. And if you are to join the play, how would you go about doing that? Like, do you have any tips on how to join? Yeah, that's really important. You don't want to take over. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. I, I have learned that lesson myself. Uh, when I first went into the classroom, I remember there were three little people who were in the home living center and they were trying to decide what they were going to have for dinner. This would be, you know, any time a group of children are playing together. And uh, I saw they were kind of fumbling. They were kind of frustrated with it. So I went over with them and, and uh, became the leader. Uh, <laughs> and I said to them, oh, well, let's have pizza. And they all looked at me. And then they left. Oh. 
<laughs> one time I realized this is their play. This mm -hmm. is not my play. This is their play. I need to come in and take, oh, what's for dinner? Can I have a piece? Whatever they're doing. Exactly. I, I become a part of that rather than being the person who's directing them. But it took me one time to really figure that out. <laughs> That's why we've had a lot of mud pies in our lives, right? All of these parents, right? Yeah. Donna, do you want to ask the next question? Yeah. Oh, actually, um, so, you know what? while you, do, well, I'm going to, okay, you go for it. And I'm going to okay. look at some of the um, questions as from the attendees. Go ahead. Okay. Um. So the last, the one question we had was, is it okay for my child to play alone? Um, yes. How can I encourage them to play with others? And, you know, you have those introverts and extrovert kids and sometimes, play I at at times trouble when we're at the park and my daughter is just you know playing by herself and some of the kids will come and want to play with them and she just is on her own little and I try to myself I try to encourage her like oh you know go ahead and play and see you know introduce yourself and it's like how much is too much and she it's just a, it's, a, it's a difficult bad ba balance there uh but um, I'm an only child and I played by myself all the time. Uh, there was nobody else to play with me. Uh, and, and then I bet that your daughter is a very creative person because a creative child is going to really be able to play on their own. Uh, they're not going to need anybody else. They can come up with their own ideas, their own way of doing it. It's a great thing to watch them. And so although we want them to be social, this may be her her form of joy is working on her own. And so it's, it's okay to encourage her to sometimes have somebody else or somebody involved, but also treasure the fact that she is so able to do it on her own and be an independent thinker. That is wonderful. All right. Well, we have some um, great questions coming in through the chat. Um, so the first question is, what are your thoughts about older kids, like children who are older than nine because i think you went up until eight so like nine plus um the in our in our district that would be our um half day students um and daniel wright students so what are your thoughts on that on um, what i have to say my most of my education and experience has been zero to eight mm -hmm. uh, and, but i do want to um caution people uh as i mentioned in my talk that when they're seven and eight, we don't want to push them into these games with rules. Mm -hmm. uh, it is really not developmentally appropriate. It is also very stressful for them. And then when they can't do it, we as parents get upset. Why are they not doing that? Why can't they abide by the rules? Does it mean they're going to rob the bank next week? Uh, probably not. Uh, but, you know, we, we as parents go off. <laughs> what will happen to them as an adult? And, you know. Right. Uh, but I think that we just have to realize that that at this point, uh, you know, that's where they need to be. They need to be. But the the nine year olds, I believe everybody needs to play. Mm -hmm. You know, all of the new research is saying that one of the reasons that you and I are so stressed out is because we never play. Mm -hmm. We don't have a time to let relax, to do something enjoyable, to do something that's fun. And certainly we want them to be a part of that. The play will look different because they're at a different developmental level, but they still will be playing, trying out things, working it out. One of the things that I, I had to learn as I was working with my own child, uh, own children, was that it's okay to make a mistake. Mm -hmm. uh, and I had a daughter say to me one time, you never make a mistake. And I just had to laugh. Uh, <laughs> because I make mistakes all the time. And, and what I realized was that she didn't see me make those. Mm -hmm. She only saw me when it was, when it worked. Right. Uh, and so from then on, I really made a conscious effort to let her see me make mm -hmm. a mistake. That didn't work. What other way might we do it? It's okay. It didn't work. We'll, we'll think we'll figure it out, you know, so that, that, that's part of that resilience, being able to realize that this one mistake is not going to ruin my life. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm going to be able to pick it up, find another way of doing it and go on. Uh, and that's really important for children to learn. Thank you. 
Um, so another question, this one, I have a, a, tw- a 19 month old, so this one hits hard with me. Um, <laughs> Well, you like have the, blessings. Nineteen yeah, months yeah, are yes. people. <laughs> yes. So she was. The question was: Kids who, who play with water or with messy sensory items involving keeping the mess um, in one little spot. How to handle as a parent, or how to got you want them to play, but to keep, I'm assuming the question she's trying to figure out how to have it where it's in one it's, location. Yeah, that's one of the reasons. That's what's coming to me. That's that's my dread every time. It's like, how? Well, that's one of the reasons that I really wanted to develop these little play areas in your home, because it does contain it, and and you know, play is messy. I mean, let's just understand that play is messy, Uh, but children learn to be responsible and help clean up that mess. And the 19 month old will be a little less likely to do that. But <laughs> <laughs> but the other one, what is three and four? I have a six, um, a five-year-old, a 11 and nine. The five-year-old will be happy to help. Uh, and and that's a great way to get her to do it. You know, have her to model how this works. How do you clean it up? How do you put the things back in the container? But you got to make it easy for them. You can't make it too hard for them to clean up. You need a big sponge. It's got <laughs> a bubbly water in it. You've got a big basket that they can throw things in to put them away. You make it adapt and easy for them to do it. And then when they do, you know, you let them know how responsible they were. Thank you so much for helping me put those back in. And tomorrow they'll be where you know they are and you can use them again. So it's 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 part of the process. But you and I, we got to relax and understand it is <laughs> going to be messy. <laughs> yeah. So um, one of the parents was um, reflecting on one of your stories and <laughs> mentioned that um you know you had um a story where about the little girl who is playing with the baby and um how basically um you know she said that um the baby was crying and she imitated what the mother would say and you were thinking maybe the little girl was showing empathy towards her mother but the this parent was wondering do you think that this child was actually reflecting on the fact that she doesn't like her mom shouting you know like is that <laughs> You know, what are your thoughts on that? Like, I guess it really goes back to like what you're learning from their behaviors, right? Like well, the thing is, you know, little children are, have big eyes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. And, and they watch us and really they watch us more than they listen to their words because sometimes they're getting mi- mixed messages. Mm-hmm. Um, we're saying one thing and we're doing something else and that doesn't quite gel with them. And so they'll go with what you say. Mm -hmm. Uh, what you do uh that that's what they really watch um it's like one of the one parent told me one time that the only thing his his son learned in in the pre-k program was curse words and I said really and he said yes he comes home and he's rattling off all these words that we and he says you know I just don't know where he heard that and I'm like "Mm, me neither (laughs) And his little boy was so great. He would he would do the motions with it, you know. He would give the facial expressions. He would hammer his hand down and say this word. And I mean, it was no doubt where it came from. It wasn't from the preschool program. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, as being a conscious listener, I said, oh, really? You know, "Mm." (laughs) but, you know, they're they're watching us. Yes. And and I think when we do something that we think is a bad example, we need to say that, you know, I really lost it. I shouldn't have said that. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry about saying that Mm -hmm. Um, because that's that's what they need to hear. That sometimes, you know, mama and daddy and, and granny and the friend next door say things that they're sorry they say. Right, it's, right. Okay. Gives us that opportunity to repair, yeah. right? Yeah. It does. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, so, do you, Nani, do you want to get the next question? Yeah. Um, so, I guess I, this might be on your website. Are there certain toys worth buying or toys we should avoid um, and buying when it comes to 
play with the kids? Okay. I know it, in early childhood, at least, you don't really have to buy anything. You can just collect things that you have. Uh, but because people like to buy toys, <laughs> what we want to be careful about is buying a toy that only does one thing. We want a toy that does many things. Building blocks are always my great example. You know, building blocks can be anything. They can be whatever you want them to be. But several years ago, there was a cow on the market that was a toy. And you poured water in the cow. And you did the cow's tail like this. And it was supposed to give milk. Oh. That's all it did. That's all. I mean, it, you poured water, you did the tail. That's it. <laughs> I mean, what else can you do with a cow that drinks water? Uh, you know, it's very limited play opportunities. You want things that are flexible, can do lots of different things. Uh, a big, a good, uh, a good block set, or a good uh, collection of junk materials to do art projects with. Those are the kinds of things that will really be the most beneficial for young children. As they get older and more refined skills, then you can go into the more uh, advanced kind of materials. But little ones, everything is a possible learning. Right. Um, I'm going to squeeze in one last question and. This would be, what what do you think about if you, what, a lot of parents I think worry, like what if their interpretation of the play their child is doing is too young, you know, for what they think is age appropriate? Should parents discourage that? What should they do about play of that nature? If they, if they no. feel. Yeah. Um, if a child gets a toy they've never had before, let's mm -hmm. say they've got uh, a, a ball that has a bell inside of it. They've never had that before. And it's a new toy. And so the first thing they have to do is explore it independently. They may be four years old, but that is what they have to do first. They have to explore it. And so whatever age they are, they can go through all of these different kinds of play. So I think it needs to just be relaxed about it. There isn't a certain age and a certain kind of play that a child should be doing. Um, that's why I wanted you to have in your handout all the different kinds of plays there are. Uh, my favorite has always been sociodramatic play, and I've done a lot of research on that uh, and watch children play and do those things. But it's just one of the ways that you can play. Okay. We have one more question from the um from our audience. It says, okay. my seven-year-old always asked me to be part of their play. How, sorry, I lost my, uh, how to make her more independent. I would, I would go in very gradually. Uh, I would not take a leadership role. I would let her know that she's in charge, I'm following her leadership. Uh, and then when the opportunity comes available, when it seems like she's carrying on by herself, then I move out, I get out of the play so that she can go ahead and, and do it on her own. And then I may come back and say, oh, I see you've done, you know, and I talk about it. So I don't just leave them unattended. Huh. Uh, and say, well, they're they're all, they're okay. They're playing. Now, I want to encourage that. Oh, you did that on your own. I'm so proud of the way you thought of that idea. You know, so that you you are gradually going out, not just abruptly. Uh, I think that works best with most children. Dr. Isabel, thank you so much for such it's an important. It's been great being here. And if I can help you in any way with any of the materials, just let me know. Well, we appreciate just the fact that you took so much time to make a presentation just for our families, you know, and um, we really enjoyed uh, your talk. I think um, Jen is going to, you know, it was just so informative and I'm sure uh, Ms. Hoffmeyer will be, you know, mm -hmm. referencing your talk for some time. So It was well. music to my ears. It was so validating <laughs> and yes. it was the you were perfect for us. I really oh, appreciate I'm so it. Glad. Well, that's so a great thing for me to know. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, keep then, up the good work. Oh, that's awesome. And then Jen Ernstine's going to um, post a slide for our next event. Um, we are finishing up with um, this event and moving on to our other programming for the year. Um, we have two programs coming up. 
Our next one is with Devorah Heitner, um, and she is a social media guru and really has helped us in the past. And she has just published a book um, titled Growing Up in Public, and she's doing a program for um, ourselves, Stevenson High School, D102, um, and D96. And we are looking forward to hosting her on October 11th at 7 to 8 o'clock. We are, um, the registration for that program is open. And then um, later in the um, year on November 15th, we are going to be having a program um, called The Power of Belonging. And this program is going to be um, piggybacking on some survey information that we've collected about how fostering a sense of belonging can lead to school success. Um, and we are excited to have Sabrina Rahman be presenting in this presentation. So we hope to see um, families at these presentations as well. But um, for today's program, thank you again, um, Dr. Isbell. Thank you, Ms. Hoffmeyer, for providing us with this wonderful idea for this topic. Um, and I think hopefully it has left parents with a lot of great ideas and reinforcement of the messages you already reinforced. So thank you.